And that's what we need to do. We need to speak to Goliath, speak to the mountain, speak to the demons, speak to depression, speak to the bad mood, speak to the anger, speak to the sin, speak, 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 because we've got power in our words to put this enemy to flight. But I'm going to speak to you on the power of our words. And I've spoken on this before, often, because, and the reason is our words are so incredibly powerful. We can make our day and destroy our day with a word and we do it all the time. Some of us do it all day long. Our words are either medicine or poison. Which one? We are poisoning our minds. We're poisoning our bodies. We're poisoning our health all day long by the words because the word is medicine. It's either good medicine or bad medicine. What's that? Proverbs 18. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. And we are going to eat, it goes on to say, and we will eat the fruit of one or the other. So we literally eat the fruit of our very own lips. Life, it says, the Bible says life and death, that's Proverbs 18, life and death are in the power of the tongue. So we are literally speaking over ourselves and over our families, life or death. We have to choose. We have to now be now we're going to be different. We're going to know, I'm, am I speaking life or am I speaking death? Because we're constantly saying things. We're constantly saying the wrong things. And, you know, I, 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 there are some declarations that we can make over our lives. Sometimes we refuse to say them because it's not, we don't see it as the truth. Well, I can't just say I'm well, if I'm not well, but we say I'm sick all day, all the time. We can, we aren't afraid to say, I'm sick, I'm dying, I don't feel good. Um, because those words elicit something that's going to help us. They, they elicit um, pity or they elicit somebody to understand, but they're not helpful. They're actually very, very harmful. So what I'm going to do today is to get us off of those words and onto the word of God and, and what words to start declaring. Now, I've taught this before because God's word is powerful, that Jesus is the word of God, that Jesus's words are powerful, that remember, I, I and I, you may not, so I'm going to just briefly go over this. God's word is powerful. We know that. He made heaven and earth with a word. I'm not going to go into the that teaching, but God made heaven and earth and everything in it by a word. Now, Jesus also has the power of the word. Jesus is the word. Jesus is the word of God made flesh. And then when the centurion, and the, this is what the Bible says in Psalm 107, it says, he sent forth, this is God, God sent forth his word and healed them. Well, Jesus is the word he sent, and he sent forth Jesus to heal. And the centurion recognized that in Jesus. So when the centurion so the centurion said, hey, I'm not worthy that you should even come under my roof. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. The centurion's servant was desperately in need of, he was paralyzed and in great agony, it said. And Jesus said, just, Jesus said, um, oh, I, I'll come, I'll come and heal him. And, and he said, no, I'm not worthy to have you enter under my roof, just say the word and my servant will be healed. And Jesus was amazed at his faith because he was amazed because he realized that this man recognized him as the word of God. He recognized him as God, <laughs> that he could just speak. No one else can speak something into, into existence. N nobody else can speak to the wind and the waves. So here's the thing. Jesus also gave us the same power with our words, the same power. <laughs> Jesus gave us the same power to speak and to command. And he gave us authority to do it in his name. So Jesus said, 
Um, in Mark 11, I'm going to read Mark 11, 23 and 24. He said, Jesus said, have faith in God. And he's speaking to his apostles. Amen. I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it shall be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Well, this is just a huge two, two verses of a lot, but what he's saying in general is you have power to command with your voice and whatever you say backed up with faith in your heart, faith in God. He starts at saying, have faith in God. Amen. I say to you, whoever says, whoever speaks. So our words have power. So therefore we have to use that. We have to use our words and we're afraid to use our words. I, I mean, we are even afraid to use our words just to praise God. We're just so un, not used to it. We're used to complaining. We're used to arguing. We're used to um, discussing. We're used to doing everything with our mouth except praising God. It's amazing how hard when it comes to praising God, we just get, we fall silent. But we've got to, we've got to change and retrain ourselves to start speaking. And then I say to you, whoever says, so God's, Jesus is saying, I'm giving you power with your voice. Your words are powerful. So not only is God's words powerful, not only is our Jesus's words powerful, but he made our words powerful and our words have power. We can, we, we know this, we can make or break the atmosphere with just a word in our homes. We can kill destroy somebody's mood somebody's confidence with just a word we have power and god's saying now i want to train you to speak to speak words of faith to speak words my words over every situation because the devil wants us to speak his words over every situation he wants us to continue speaking death over every situation. But God's saying, no, I want you to speak my words. He says, whoever says to this mountain, so you have to speak to a mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea. He's saying, if you say that, it will do it. it and it goes on to say, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen. You have to have faith in what you're saying. It shall be done for him. So I want to today encourage us to use that power, to use the power that God's given us. Our words have power. We're using them, but now we got to use them in the right way and to really step out and use them. Our words can follow the devil or to follow God. One way that we speak is we can have fellowship with the devil, fellowship with depression and anxiety, we can fellowship with it or we can fellowship with God, but you can't really do both. You're think of it this way. I, I'm speak, I'm one, I'm in one camp or the other. I am following the devil. I'm following after his will for my life. I'm fellowshipping, hanging out with him, enjoying his company all day long. That's what he wants. The devil wants you to enjoy his company all day long, or I can fellowship with God. You know, one way that we talk is an agreement with God's, the devil's plan for our life or God's plan for our life. Our words declare what we are in agreement with. Our words betray our faith. What Our words betray what we have faith in, who we have faith in. What we are saying shows what we have faith in. This is so important. What we say all day betrays our faith. So what are you saying? We have more faith in, I mean, this is just as a general rule, as, a, as our society, we have more faith in cancer's ability to kill than we have in God's ability to heal. Our words convince us of that. Our words are, are convincing us of what we have faith in. Our words are convincing God what we have faith in. Our words convince the devil about who we have faith in. Mark chapter five, 
Verse 27, she heard about Jesus, came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. I love the way it says that all in one sentence. She heard about him and then she came up um, up behind him in the crowd and, and touched his cloak because she had said, if I but touch his clothes, I shall be healed. And then she went and did it. Now, in another version, it says, she, I, I picture her in her house saying, you know what? If I just go and touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. But her words were important. We have to find a way to say that about our situation. Wait, wait, if I trust in God, <laughs> I will be well, because he said so. He said, all who believe in me will be healed. I am the God that heals. <laughs> So if he is the God who heals all who call upon him, then I, then I need to, to say that, say that to yourself. I'm, I'm going to trust God to heal me because he took all my sin. He, he took all my diseases. He loves me so much. He, the Bible says he took my infirmities. He bore my diseases. Therefore, I'm going to start saying that. No, Jesus took my infirmities and bore my diseases. Therefore I am healed. So what is it that you're saying? Jesus doesn't want me to remain depressed. Therefore, I, I'm going to trust him to deliver me. What is your words speaking? What are you saying? Because whatever you are saying is what you're believing. If, we, if we're saying, I'm so depressed, I'm dying, I'm tired, um, that's what we are, we have faith in. Oh, how, how, I, I, I think I might want to open it up to what is it that we're saying? I'm, I'm, um, forgetting it, what we saying, because I have so stopped saying those kind of things. I don't even know what it is we're saying wrong anymore. Um, because I have put this so into practice that I will not speak death to myself, but what we are, but also I need to do is to speak more life. Even though I'm not speaking death, I need to speak life over every situation. Because Mary I want to, yeah. I just, what you just said, I just wanted you to say again that, um, because you said it quickly, it's not just um, enough to not speak death, but it's just as important to speak life. Oh, yes. I just want to, I think that's yeah. really important. Yeah, I have, I actually have so many declarations and I will, yeah. I will tell people these declarations and I will ask them to say these declarations and they won't. People refuse it. People refuse to say, why, how can I say that I am healed when I don't feel like it? Or it do, it, the doctor says the opposite, or I'm believing, how do I say that? I, I would be lying if I said that, but you're not lying. And that's what I want to convince you of today. That is the truth. Because if God took away your infirmities and bore your diseases, then you don't have to be sick. <laughs> you don't have to be depressed. If Jesus bore it, I mean, imagine the God who brings peace. How could he ever want you depressed and anxious and fearful and worried? And um, oh, amen. So let me just give you an example of a declaration that's so hard. I remember once... I and this was, I was walking into the garage and I was saying, I, I had a major headache. I told you this last week, but I'm saying it again. I, because I remember, I remember it so well because I thought I can't say I'm healed when I'm not, but I just did. I said, no, I'm healed by his stripes. I'm healed because when we say by his stripes, I am healed. What we're, we're realizing is he took those wounds 2000 years ago and paid for my healing. Therefore that healing is mine. So therefore I am healed. Why am I healed? Because he healed me. I'm not healed because I'm, I'm healing myself or I'm looking forward to being healed. I'm healed because he decided to heal me a long time ago. I'm just, I'm, I'm so blessed that I am healed, but I have to accept that as the truth, not the pain in my head. And I remember saying it, even though I didn't want to say it because it felt weird to me to say it. And I said, I am healed. And it's really hard to say because I can say, I can pray to be healed, Lord, heal me. But 
if I say I am healed, I'm, I'm, that's where faith comes in. Remember Jesus said, whatever you say to this mountain, get up. And so if I say to this headache, get up and move and go throw yourself into the sea and do not doubt, but believe that what I say will happen. It shall be done for me. But God goes on to say, Jesus goes on to say, therefore, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Well, I have to believe that what Jesus did for me was real. So when I'm walking and I'm declaring it, I'm really putting my faith in when I say I am healed. I'm saying, no, I believe more in what he did than this pain in my head <laughs> or, or anything else. I remember a doctor was going to, I had such bad migraines that the doctor gave me medicine. I quit taking the medicine because it just did weird things to me. So I quit taking it. And then she wanted to put me on a permanent, like forever medicine that will forever take away my headache. Thankfully, I never did it because so basically what I'm saying is I can have faith in these medicines that have so many side effects that will keep me addicted for the rest of my life, or I can have faith in what he did. So basically when I say I am healed, so I'm walking to the garage and I'm saying it, I'm just, I'm just saying it in faith. I am healed by his stripes. I am healed. I took the step into the garage and my headache was gone. And I remember God teaching me that my words are so important. Um, my husband and I will never say to each other, we've just gotten to this point where we will never say that we are sick. And even though we want the, uh, if I want him to know I'm sick, I'll say by his stripes, I'm healed. It's really a, a funny way of saying, I don't want you to know that I'm sick, but I'm going to tell you I'm sick by saying by his stripes, I'm healed, which is, is really wrong. Um, but what I really need to do is say, no, I'm not going to receive your pity because really, I just want him to feel sorry for me. I want him to cook dinner. I want him to do my chores for me this day. I want him to allow me to, to lay down all day and be in bed all day. When I say I, by his, when I say I don't feel good, I'm sick. I'm, I'm fearful. What I want is for him to rescue me, but I've already been rescued. I need to count on this rescue because I'm not going to be able to count on my husband rescuing me. It's a false rescue. His pity isn't going to rescue me. His pity isn't going to help me. It's not, it's only going to delay it and ruin me and delay it. So I can have pity or I can have healing. I can have pity or I can have power, but it's our words that I'm, that are so powerful. So I want to quickly go into David and Goliath because David really shows off the power of words so awesomely. And this is how we have to be. We have to be like David. And this is from first Samuel verse chapter 17, which is the story of David and Goliath. And, and David comes and he speaks to, to, to Saul. And he says, this is what he says to Saul. So here, David shows up, as you know, the story, they're in the middle of a battle. They aren't fighting yet because Goliath comes out and says, just send me one person. That one person will challenge me. We will fight. Nobody else has to fight. Nobody else has to get killed. Let's two of us fight. Whoever wins, wins the war. <laughs> Whoever wins gets to put the other, the other army and the other nation will take them as slaves. I mean, it was, it was a, it was, nobody wanted to fight Goliath. Nobody wanted to lose Nobody wanted to lose to Goliath. But see, we have a God who's backing us up that we will never lose. And only David knew that. Only David knew who his God was, that he had that he had God backing him up. And we have to know that we have God. So this is what he said. These are the words that came out of his mouth. He said, oh, my Lord, don't lose heart. <laughs> Saul, king, don't lose heart. I'm here. Let me, let me go fight this. Your, let me go fight this Philistine. But Saul answered, no, 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 you can't. You can't. So and we're going to hear you can't all, all day long. And it's the you can'ts that are trying to suffocate us and to get us to back down, to get us to back off of faith. No, you can't go up against this Philistine and fight him. You're just a youth. He's been a warrior from, his, look how big he is. He's been a warrior from his youth. He knows how to fight. He knows how to kill. That's what he does. Look how big he is. 
But David did not let those words convince him. He said, no, no, no. I, I used to tend my father's sheep. Whenever a lion or a bear would come, I would fight the lion, fight the bear, kill the bear, and rescue the lamb. This Philistine will be just like one of them. You know why? Because he's insulted the armies of the living God. You, you have to realize that this, whatever's coming against you, I mean, depression, cancer, anxiety, whatever's coming against you is coming against the daughter or son of God himself. <laughs> this, this demon, I, I call it that, is insulting God by insulting you. By coming against you, he's insulting what Jesus did at the cross. Uh, no, no, no. I, I, I will fight this Philistine because he is insulting my God. I will fight this depression because depression is insulting Jesus. He's making a mockery of what Jesus did. Did Jesus die and take your infirmities? Did he bear your sickness like he said, like the Bible says he did? The word of God is true. Isaiah 54 is about Jesus. God said so in his word. God even refers to it. The Holy Spirit refers to that scripture. Jesus took our infirmities, the Bible says, and bore our diseases. This depression, this anxiety is saying, no, he didn't. I'm stronger than Jesus. So what David said is this circum this uncircumcised, meaning he's not part of the not part of the kingdom. He's not part of God's family. He's an outsider. He has no defense. He has nothing. We have God to defend us. We have God to empower us. We've got God back in us. And Goliath is defying. Not just the army of the living God, but God himself. When this disease comes against you, it's defying God. It's saying, prove your faith. Prove your God is bigger than me. And, and we, let, we let the enemy win all the time. We let the enemy insult Jesus all the time. Because Jesus did it for us. And he said, for us, we need to just say. So David's about to say <laughs> and to, to Goliath. And that's what we need to do. We need to speak to Goliath, speak to the mountain, speak to the demons, speak to depression, speak to the bad mood, speak to the anger, speak to the sin, speak, 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 because we've got power in our words to put this enemy to flight. Okay. David continues and he goes, the same God who delivered me from the claws of the lion and the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. I am confident, he says. And Saul finally was convinced and said, go. So now here comes David and he's, and he's coming right up against Gol Goliath. And this is what Goliath says to him. Goliath now is going to try to convince David that he can't do it. He goes, what do you do? What? Am I a dog that you come at me with a stone? You come against me with your staff? The Philistine cursed David right in front of him. But see, David let those words go one in one ear and right out the other. He he wasn't he wasn't phased by those words. We are phased by what the doctor says. We are phased by what the 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 devil is speaking to our mind all day long. We are phased, but David wasn't phased. It didn't phase him one bit. He said, "Am I a dog that you come against me with a staff?" Then David, cur then the Philistine cursed David by his gods and said to him, come here and I'm going to feed your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. That's what Goliath said. I I'm going to kill you and I'm going to feed your flesh. I'm going to feed you to the birds. I'm going to feed you to the beasts of the field. David, that didn't, he wasn't intimidated. We're so easily intimidated, but he was not intimidated. Why? Because he knew who his God was. He knew who was defending him. No one else. This is what surprises me, but not one other person in the whole army 
believed like David. Nobody. The whole army was afraid of Goliath. The whole army. So David starts to speak. Now David's going to speak. And this is how we have to speak. You come against me with what? A sword, a spear, a scimitar. <laughs> but I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have insulted. It's, it's the God that he's insulting. It's your God that, that these, this sickness is insulting. It's not just you, it's God. He wants to destroy God's, God's power, God's word. The devil's always out to kill any, in, any influence God has in our lives. All right. So this is what he says. He goes on to say, today, now he's talking very much faith. Today, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. I will strike you down. I will cut off your hand. He hadn't done a thing yet. He just knows what he's going to do. Today, the Lord shall deliver you into my hand. We need to say this. Today, I will strike you down and cut off your head. This very day, this very day, I will feed your dead body and the dead bodies of the entire Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. This little boy is saying that. Today, not only do you die, Goliath, but you all, you all, it's over. Today, it's over. I'm here. That's what we have to say. It's over. I'm here. <laughs> all this multitude too shall learn that it is by the, it is not by the sword or the spear that the Lord saves for the battle belongs to the Lord who shall deliver you into my hands. God, God, David is saying not only Everyone's going to know about this. Everyone will know that God saves. And it's about time that everyone in your family knows that's, that's what we're here for. We're not here just to save ourselves, but to save everyone in our family. Everyone will know what a God we have. And we get to pass down this new testimony, not the testimony that I suffered with allergies my whole life or I suffered with uh, anxiety my whole life, or I suffered with uh, arthritis my whole life. I, I know every problem my, my grandparents had, because my grandmother had, because that was it, it, we talked about it all the time. And she talked about it. I knew her problems. But you know what? Our kids, our children, the, what, what are we passing down? We're passing down the victory. <laughs> Everyone's going to know what a great God we serve. And it starts with us starting to say it, say it before it happens. Say, you know what? Now I know that's what the doctor says, but guess what? I'm trusting. I'm not, I'm trusting God to heal me. I'm trusting that I am healed, that this is that, that God has healed me. He has already healed me. He's already written his prescription and filled it. His blood is running through my veins. His power is living in me to cleanse me of all, every evil, every rogue, every bad cell, every, every um, sick cell in me is being washed by the blood of Jesus that's flowing over me, cleansing me. The word of God is like a water that cleanses us. Imagine if we took that medicine. Imagine if we just spoke the word out loud every four hours for our medicine, spoke it out loud. Let our, let our ears hear it. Let the, let the disease that's in us hear that word and flee from our bodies. We've got to make that decision. And our words really show what we believe in. Faith has to be released. You know, we, we not only have to have faith, but we have to release our faith and it's released by our words and by our actions. Um, let me just read a few of these and then I'm done. Um, declarations of things to say. Um, I'm just going to read a few of them. I am, I am the Lord who heals you. God says, father, you are the Lord who heals me. We need to be saying, Lord, you are the Lord who heals me because your word says so. So therefore I can confidently say, Father, you are the Lord that heals me. My God fights for me against this disease and brings me victory. My God is fighting 
for me against this disease and bringing me victory. My God is fighting for me. I will not fear. I am strong and steadfast. I have no fear because God is with me. I am filled with faith because my father is removing all sickness from me. God has sent forth his word and healed me. My God fills my days with good things. My youth is renewed. The Bible says he took our infirmities and bore our diseases. So therefore I can say Jesus took my infirmities and bore my diseases. And then I have to actually say that out loud and act like it. Start living. Start living like you really believe it. Like, it, like it's true. Like his word is true. By his stripes, I am healed. Jesus forgives all my sins, heals all my diseases. Arthritis? Mm -mm. Arthritis is under my feet. I'm free from arthritis. Why? Because I canceled it. Because I said to this mountain, get up and move. So therefore, I said to arthritis, get up. You have no right to my body. Arthritis runs in my family, but it won't anymore. Not anymore. Because the, the buck stops here with me. I had arthritis trying to come on my body, on my on my hands. They would they would click and just be stuck there. And I'd have to break them out. And every time I did that, I said, no, arthritis, be gone in the name of Jesus. I rebuke you, be gone. I said to this mountain, get up and move. Therefore, I can I can declare, no, I don't have arthritis. Amen. I want to, if we have time right now, to read another scripture verse together, and it's in Numbers chapter 14. And it's so, so important for us to read this together. So if we want to turn to uh, Numbers chapter 14, I believe. But I just want to start with uh, uh, Numbers 13, verse 25. And let's read it together. After reconnoitering the land for 40 days, they returned, met Moses and Aaron and the whole community of the Israelites in the desert of Paran at Kadesh, and made a report to them all and showed them the fruit of the country. They told Moses, we went into the land to which you sent us. It does indeed flow with milk and honey, and here is its fruit. However, the people who are living in the land are fierce, and the towns are fortified and very strong. Besides, we saw descendants of the Anakim there. Amicalites live in the region of the Negrev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites live in the highlands, and the Canaanites along the seacoast and the banks of the Jordan. <clears throat> Verse 30. Anyone else want to read? Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people because they are stronger than we. They gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which, had, which, which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. And there was, and there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which come from, which come from the giants. And in our eyes, we are, we were like grasshoppers. And so we were in their eyes. So here they are, God saying, this is the land I promised you. I saved you from Egypt to give you this land. This is the land. This is the land I promised you. And he says, go check out the land. And they checked it out. They actually carried a, a, a grape cluster together, two grown men on a pole because it was that heavy, one cluster of grapes. It was that big. And they said, wow, the land is great, but it can't be, we can't take this land because it's filled with giants. It's, it's too big. It's too big for us. And they said, we felt like we were grasshoppers. And so we must have seemed to them here. We're going, it's, it's, it's almost like the giant Goli David and Goliath syndrome. We can't do it. We can't do it. 
we are like grasshoppers and we must have looked like grasshoppers to them. If you think we can take this land, you're wrong. And so I just want to go to 14 verse two through 10. I think let's, let's keep reading. Mom, do you want to read? I don't know if you have a microphone. No? Anyone? I can. Go ahead, Maria. 14.1, right? Start with one. Then all the people began weeping aloud, and they carried on all night. Their voices rose in a great chorus of complaint against Moses and Aaron. We wish we had died in Egypt, they wailed, or even here in the wilderness rather than be taken into this country ahead of us. Jehovah will kill us there, and our wives and little ones will become slaves. Let us get out of here and return to Egypt. The idea swept wow. the camp. Let's select a leader to take us back to Egypt, they shouted. No hard opinion. I can't find who's talking. Um... Just a second. Okay, found it. Sorry, Maria. Go ahead. No problem. Do you want me to stop there or continue? Yeah. Yeah, we could stop for a minute. Let us appoint a leader and go back to Egypt. We want to go back to slavery. We don't want to trust you to bring us into the land you promised us. We instead, we want to go back to Egypt. We want to go back to slavery. We want to go back to being slaves. I love this at this, the whole, now all they heard was, well, from the, they heard the reports, the whole nation heard the reports and they are crying all night long and wailing and grumbling and complaining against Moses. And God's about to, uh, God's about to get very angry <laughs> because this is the same group that just came through the Red Sea. This is the same group that saw the Nile turn to blood. This is the same group that saw him part the Red Sea, but they don't trust him to bring, bring them into the land. They still are trusting the giants. They still are trusting in failure, basically, right? All right, verse five. Okay. Then Moses and Aaron fell face downward on the ground before the people of Israel. Two of the spies, Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephune, ripped their clothing <clears throat> and, sailed to all, and said to all the people, It is a wonderful country ahead, and the Lord love, loves us. He will bring us safely into the land and give it to us. It is very fertile, and a land flowing with milk and honey. Oh, do not rebel against the Lord, and do not fear the people of the land, for they are but bread for us to eat. The Lord is with us, and he has removed his protection from them. Don't be afraid of them. In answer, the whole community threatened to stone them. So now God's about to give his sentence. And anyone want to read verse 11 and 12? I will. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? Will they never believe me? Even after all the miraculous signs I have done among them, <clears throat> I will disown them <clears throat> and destroy them with a the plague. Then I will make you into a nation greater and mightier than they are. Wow. So he's saying, forget Abraham. I'm starting over with you, Mo Moses. <laughs> so here's Moses saying, forgive them, Lord, right? forgive them. Now here's the Lord's answer. And this is what is so important. And I want you to hear today because we, we literally get what we say. And it's so important what we say, because God promises what you say is what you get. All right. So let's, let's read verse 20. The Lord answered, I pardon them as you have asked yet by my life and the Lord's glory that fills the whole earth, of all the men who have seen my glory and the signs I worked in Egypt and in the desert, and who nevertheless have put me to the test ten times already and have failed to heed my voice, 
Not one shall see the land which I promised an oath to their fathers. None of these who have spurned me shall see it. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me unreservedly, I will bring him into the land where he has just been, and his descendants shall possess it. But now, since the Amalekites and the Canaanites are living in the valleys, turn away tomorrow and set out in the desert on the Red Sea Road. Hmm. The Lord also said to Moses and Aaron, How long will this wicked community grumble against me? I have heard the grumblings of the Israelites against me. Tell them, by my life, says the Lord, I will do to you just what I have heard you say. Here in the desert shall your dead bodies fall. Of all your men of 20 years or more registered in the census who grumbled against me, not one shall enter the land where I solemnly swore to settle you, except Caleb, son of Jephunan, and Joshua, son of Nun. Your little ones, however, who you said would be taken as booty, I will bring in, and they shall appreciate the land you spurned. But as for you, your bodies shall fall here in the desert, here where your children must wander for 40 years, suffering for your faithlessness, till the last of you lies dead in the desert. 40 days you spent in, the, in scouting the land, and 40 years you shall suffer for your crimes, one year for each day. Thus you will realize what it means to oppose me. I, the Lord, have sworn to do this to all this wicked community that conspired against me. Here in the desert, they shall die to the last man. Amen. I just want to, to bring up, by my life, says the Lord, I will do to you, verse 28, just what I have heard you say. Yeah. You know, their complaining was what they were saying. I want to go back to Egypt. You want to go back to slavery? You want to go back? They said, we're going to die. We're going to die. And he says, if that's that's the way you're talking, I'm going to die. You're going to die. You're going to get what you say. He said, by my life, says the Lord, I will do to you just what I have heard you say. Here in the desert shall your bodies fall. We our complaining is um is an, an affront is a is against God. <laughs> and we like to do it. We we we're just we're just habitual complainers, so we have to realize that. In your book, Mary Beth, in your book doesn't say um a complaining or worrying is a lack of faith. <laughs> It is. I think I got that. I've got something, one of those highlighted, but that, because my husband started off saying something like, well, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. We might, I'm saying, no, we don't. No, the Lord's got us. We're taking care of, you know, he started this kind of like, well, you never can tell. And I'm like, no, we can't. It's going to be good. <laughs> yeah, we can. <laughs> it is so true. It is so true. Oh, that's said, so good. No, I said, don't even, talk, don't talk like that. Don't start the conversation. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Change your words. Change the conversation. Change your words because your words are killing you. Our words yeah. are killing us. Amen. Because we're believing that we are just um, thrown into the wind and whatever happens, happens. And what you're saying, Bitsy, is no. We do know what, what the future is. The future is good and we're in good hands. He's got a future for us and it's a future full of hope. So we have a hopeful future, not a come what may. We're not, we're not just driven to and fro. We are in God's hands. We are God's children. He's got us. I, um, I really feel like I wanted to. And since I just decided to teach this this morning, I didn't really get a chance to, I want to write out, I, I would like to do this with every single one of you write out your own scenario. What is it that you need to say? Because we're saying what the devil wants us to say, honestly, about our situation. And, you know, Bitsy's nailed it. I, I think by what you're saying, Bitsy, you're not about, you've come to that place where not, I'm not going to say what the devil wants me to say. 
I'm not, even if it makes me, even if it makes you feel good, even you want me to agree with you. I know you want me to agree with you, but if I agree with you, we'll both be wrong. I can't just agree with your negative outlook because if I do to make you feel good, like I'm in agreement with you, we'll both be wrong. And we're both going down. One of us has to say, no, we have to be willing to speak. No, it's not the truth. The truth is we're in good hands. The truth is we have, we have power to command even the wind and the waves and the storms. We really, we really do. We're just not acting in it. I even tell people, this is funny, change the tone of your voice. Sometimes I'll be praying with somebody and I'm like, well, the wine is still in your voice. You're still whining. Even yeah. though they're saying it, I'm still yeah. hearing, I know, but it's just, and I'm like, you got to change even the tone of your voice, because if I still hear the whining, then you're not, you're not, re- you're not understanding. So you're not receiving the healing yet. You got to receive the healing where now, ah, yes. I remember just yesterday, I felt this giddiness. I was telling people this morning on our call, I felt mm. giddiness come on me, like a giddiness of a little kid, like, ah, yes, yes. It's so exciting. Like what's God doing my future? It's like, uh, that good. what's God got for me? God's got something really good for me today. Yay, yay. I'm going to, I'm ready to receive it. I'm so excited. Like I'm waiting for it instead of, well, I got nothing's coming. Nothing's coming. Then nothing's coming. If nothing's coming, then you're nothing is coming, <laughs> you know, but, and I feel like God wants us to be giddy like that. I've really got the feeling that that's how God wants to see us. So expectant that he's got something good for us. Not like these, these, not like that. He put them 40 years in the desert. Until every single one of them who complained against him died. Mm-hmm. They were not going to see the promised land. Yikes. Yikes. When they were all dead, he opened up the promised land and they get, they got it. And they took it. Yeah, wow. Yeah. They had to pay and all their children had to pay that. All their children had to suffer them with them. Because of their lack of faith, faith. in him. And, and, and I'm not saying that God expects us to have, yes, he does expect us to have faith, but he, he's a lot easier with us than them because they saw the Red Sea. They, he parted the Red Sea and they walked between, the <laughs> Bible says, between two solid walls of water. I mean, it says it in there. They walked between the walls of water. It, that had to be pretty incredible. They saw the entire <clears throat> He came that we might have life and have it abundant. The devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. So whatever's coming in your life to kill, steal, and destroy, it's not of God. The devil came that we might have life and have it abundant. That's it. I'm not saying everything's going to be rosy and everything's going to be great. But I am saying that everything's going to be rosy and everything's going to be great. I I don't know. I'm, I'm believing that. Maybe I'm wrong. Don't wake me up. Maybe I'm just dreaming, but you know what? I trust that God has good things in store for me, no matter what. So I may go through some rough times, but those rough times are only to get me to my next higher level. You know what I mean? If I'm going through a rough patch or a dark time, or, 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 I mean, I don't, I don't go through dark times. There is something out there called the dark night. That is hope a bunch of crap. There's not no such thing as this dark night that we have to go through. No, we're never without him. We are the light of the world. And I guess what I'm saying is whatever we are going through, it's, it's only there to get us to the next level or it's there because we are still believing demons. That's one or the other. So you've got to know the truth. The Bible says that our the people know his voice, right? If we know his voice, then we know what's true and what's not true. We know what's of the devil and what's not. If my sheep will know my voice, you know, what we say about our children is so important. I mean, this is for every area, not just for your health, but what we say about our future, about our finances, what we Mm. speak over our lives are very important. Oh, you're, I'm never going to make it. We can't say those kind of things. This is horrible. Everything is looking. I mean, what's, what's a bad, what's an example of a bad thing? Um, we can't speak. I, never, I am not I allowed. I will not allow myself to speak negatively about my children, children. even to myself, even alone. Mm. I will mm. declare the goodness of the Lord over my children, my children. And I have 
declarations that I speak over them all the time. I declare they are wise. Mm -hmm. And and every single one of my children, I started declaring my children are wise a long time ago. I said, they are wise. They are thoughtful. They are, um, they are helpful. They are um, smart. They are leaders. They are um, diligent. They are organized. I would speak those things over my, I would never say my children are lazy. My children are so unorganized. I'm never to, to anyone. Uh, I do not speak those words over anyone about my children. I only speak um, good things. I only speak what I, what I'm giving to the Lord. So in other words, first I had to pray those Lord, I'm praying that you, you know, bring my children into all this. And then I would start um, declaring it as if it's done as if God's doing it. And really my declaration is such an act of faith. I, I have faith that you're making them wise. Both three of my children are wiser than me. I can say that honestly, not, I'm not declaring that I'm saying that honestly. Now, every single one of my children, I trust myself in their hands more than I trust myself in my own hands. That's how wise they are. My and Mary Beth, I think that goes back to years ago, years ago, you started with that problem, yeah. prayer and proclaim, you know, Right. write out your problem, write right. your prayer, and then proclaim okay. what God is doing. And then right. once you get to the proclaim, stay there, stay That's there. Me. Right. That's me. Just don't That's go back to the problem. Yeah. Never but go back to the it's problem. A, it's a learn. It's a maturity. It's a learning. It's a discipline. It's a discipline. It's a great discipline. And I want it. I should do it. We've done it before. You, you've got your problem. You write it out Then you write out your prayer regarding your problem so every single problem has a corresponding prayer and then every prayer has a corresponding declaration and the declaration is praying the prayer done so in other words my son is making foolish decisions lord i ask you to help him be wise therefore i declare my son is wise he's no longer foolish i will never speak that he's foolish again because then i'm denying god's answered my prayer and that he's doing a work in my son which he promises he promises, I will not let your children turn to the right or to the left. I will call them back. So do you still pray that prayer? No, or do you, never. Do you just do the declaration? I don't. You can pray the prayer, but that's that's acting like God is hard of hearing. And we right. really just don't believe he heard our prayer because we're because our eyes are still seeing it. Now, it's harder with younger children because we're called to grow them up. You know, I'm talking about, you know, we still have to do things, but we can still declare over them. You know, I, I'm saying my lecture, I can't lecture my older kids, but as we're younger kids, we're still called to train them. We're still, they're still in training and we're called to train them. But do I go back to the prayer? I never go back to the prayer wow. because my prayer is saying I'm still begging. That means <clears throat> I have no faith that he's doing a work in him. <clears throat> I have to God's, but God's really shown me about my kids. No. I have to believe them. I have to trust him. I have to leave them in his hands. I have to give them to him and leave them there. So if I start praying again, I've taken them out of God's hands. And now I'm praying again, begging him to do something that I've already asked him for. And I've already proclaimed. Once you get to the proclamation, you, you're done because you have to keep that proclam. I just keep proclaiming it over my kids. And it's constantly changing. I have to keep changing those declarations that I have to believe that God's doing his work in them, that they don't need to hear it from me. And that's, that's been the hardest thing it, it, for raising older kids is believing that they still need to hear from me. No, they don't. They are adults and they, they need to hear from God. And I need to trust that just like I heard from God and my life changed and turned around, I believe that they're hearing from God. And that God loves them, like Kate, like you said today, God loves them just as much as he loves me. So why wouldn't he do it for them if he did it for me? So no, I don't go back to the prayer. I really don't. I make the de declarations. It's, it's hard to ask God for something you know he's al he already, Kate, like you said the other day, he already wants it for us way more than we want it for us. He already wants it for our children way more than we want it for our children. So of course he wants you healed. Would God want anyone depressed? Is that even, it's doesn't, it goes against his nature. So there's no way. So when we pray, 
for for us to be free from depression now we have to just start declaring it i'm free from depression <laughs> and watch it just fall off of us so what we need to come up with is a prescription of what to say what to think about when the thoughts come we have to be ready and armed and we we aren't that's why we're the we're we're bowled over when the big wave comes we just the wave is taking us but we've got to be able to stand up under the wave and to push back the wave and to to stand on that solid rock which is his love his care for us he cares for me how, why how can i worry when I, god says cast all your cares upon me because i care for you so i have to say no my god cares for me he's got my back god cares for me he says so in his word he says, cast all your cares upon me because I care for you. So he, he's not going to take bad care of me. He's going to take good care of me. So I have to repeat that to myself. No, God's got me. He's real. 